bring our two uh, uh, you know, panelists, I want to give a brief uh, introduction. Uh, we have Dr. Raj Reddy with us. And uh, you know, I went to US in the 80s. Ever since then, he's been a legend uh, for all the people who went from India to there is an Indian American computer scientist called the father of artificial intelligence. He started the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. He created Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies, and uh, he is uh, a uh, winner of the Turing Award, which is sort of the Nobel in the tech world. And uh, I mean, everything about speak, uh, speech recognition, spoken language systems has his stamp in it, whatever, uh, whatever we do. And, uh, you know, be it Kaifuli or Lalitesh Katragada or any of the great AI scientists that came out on a global scene are all students of uh, uh, Dr. Raj Reddy. And so he's one of our uh, panelists. Raj, could you please turn on your video and audio? Uh, and our second panelist is Asha Jadeja. I met Asha almost 20 years ago when we were fellow venture capitalists and she stayed on and I left that field. And Asha uh, has invested, you know, she and her um, late husband, uh, Dr. Rajiv Motwani Zain, invested in over 100, I don't know, I lose count, hundreds of companies and uh, been uh, early investors in things like Google, PayPal, and uh, all the way to Yulu in India. I mean, she's not lost touch with uh, catching on to the latest uh, and greatest trends. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes a reluctant and very much a savvy investor and uh, she's balancing it with philanthropy. So Motwani Foundation is doing a lot of important work in India to uh, promote entrepreneurship, equitable uh, leadership, women leadership, etc. Uh, so with that, Asha, can you please turn on your uh, audio and video? So we have a great, great panel. So we are going to, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions. And as we mentioned, the last 20 minutes are questions from the audience. We have started having questions already in the Q&A session. So please keep posting the questions and some of you may ask it even. Uh, we encourage you to do that. So Raj and uh, Asha, welcome. Uh, and uh, Raj, I want you are, as I said, you've been involved in technology way before people knew how to spell artificial technology, probably. You know, one of the things, Raj, that's coming up a lot today is about the, the validity of the AI system. I mean, it's a great system, but are the data sets in it equitable or not? You know, there have been you know, articles written about, uh, you, you know, an AI system recognizing <laughs> black man as a chimpanzee or a health systems being biased because not enough Asian data or African data is there. All sorts of things are there. But AI has taken us to an amazing height of ability to, um, you know, uh, find advancements also. So at the beginning, when you look at the field right now, what uh, what is the advance you're most proud of you're excited about and what is the biggest concern you have that you're working on yeah the biggest concern i have at the beginning is the ethical aspects of lockdowns basically it's in you know, covid lockdowns while it may in fact you know significantly reduce the spread with the second wave and third wave, ultimately everybody gets sick and ultimately everyone has to have a vaccine or something. But the impact of the lockdown primarily falls on very poor people. Mm -hmm. People that are not able to help themselves. In particular, as soon as you lock down a whole economy, all the knowledge workers are not affected. People like you and me, yeah. we, you know, I can work from home, I still get paid and it doesn't make any difference. But if you're a service provider, especially a non-essential service provider, then you're up the creek. You just don't have any money because you're living hand to mouth in the first place. And secondly, as soon as uh, there's a shutdown, you get laid off, you have no income. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was kind of surprised even a place like Pittsburgh, 
you know, there's a huge queues for food bank, you know, food, you know, we set up, uh, you know, we contributed, you know, the Indian community also contributed substantially for providing, you know, food and, and, uh, and uh, uh, various other sustainable and sustenance things. And um, it turns out um, if you lock down everything, the R naught, the the spreading factor, branching factor, gener generation goes to zero. But you don't have to go to zero. If all you want to do is reduce the exponential growth to below one, so that it doesn't have to uh, spread exponentially. You know, it's, it's, if you're spreading, let's say you're infecting two people, every person in about 30 generations, you'll impact the entire world mm -hmm. in a billion people <clears throat> in 32 or 35 generations. Uh, <clears throat> but if you, your spreading factor is only one uh, or less than one in 34 generations, you'll impact 34 people. So it's, uh, the exponential growth is very dramatic. And all we need to do is not bring the R0 to zero, but just below one. And, uh, and one of the projects at CMU we've been working on the last few months is that these new smart sensors, smart watches that are becoming available, which will measure all the parameters that you need not just thermal screening or temperature, but you know, heart rate, oxygen rate, and uh, breathing rate, and blood pressure, all of those, uh, every hour or every 30 minutes, whatever you want. And uh, that data can be used to predict 50 hours before you're likely to show real symptoms of who are the people that are going to be impact, you know, infected, and then you can quarantine them. And the statistics are about 2%, maybe 2%, you know, less than 2% of most populations get infected. Of the 2%, only 3% of the 2% actually die. Mm. And so it's, uh, and yeah. so in order to protect the society from the, that particular kind of exponential growth, we're locking down everything. And locking down some, you know, the whole shutdown is a 500-year-old idea where, where during the time of the plague in the 14th, 15th century, they had to, they didn't know how the hell, what was happening, they couldn't contain it, they didn't know what to do. So they would kind of quarantine whole villages, they wouldn't let people, and, uh, and they, they have no way of testing it and so on. We can test now, but the testing, biomedical testing, turns out to be very slow and expensive. And therefore, by the time you test whether somebody is infected or not, already you have infected two, three generations, and, uh, and so you're not able to control it. But I think technology can be used you know, in a serious way Mm -hmm. to contain the spread and is probably the most ethical thing we can do because the people that are suffering are the poor people. Yes, definitely. And, and that has been my major concern. Yeah. Asha, uh, what do you, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're, you're a prolific investor and when you look at the uh, investments that you're looking at in AI, in, in the Valley, everything. What are some of the things you are excited about that can bring more human equality using technology? Uh, and uh, where should the line be? Uh, so <clears throat> thank you for having me. But I think I'm actually completely with, uh, you know, completely with Professor Reddy yes. on this whole idea of, uh, of bringing in technology in a pretty serious way on, uh, on, on, on addressing social issues. Uh, so for example, this whole idea that it's largely the poor people and the blacks and Latinos that are being affected by just you know, this question of the pandemic. 
uh, there is nothing like uh, AI and uh, predictive analysis and predictive sort of data, uh, you know, um, uh, algorithms that can actually tell us what who is most at risk. So the, the, the biggest issue that as a planet, what we are facing right now is that computation has not yet married health sciences. Unfortunately, that's the truth. Computation is just beginning to dip its toe into the question of, uh, of medical data, health data, and, um, and, and be able to work on, um, on, on things without stepping on too many regulatory toes. So for example, one of my investments in 23andMe uh, you know, was uh, faced unprecedented challenges on the FDA front when they were trying to uh, gather data, people's genomic data, and then do predictive uh, analysis of people's health, what genes they were likely to express in the next few years, and what diseases they were predisposed to. But we had FDA and a whole bunch of, just like in India, we had a whole bunch of regulatory <clears throat> bureaucratic uh, drag factors that affected uh, the growth of 23andMe early on, almost I'm talking about 10 years ago. I think I have a feeling that's going to change. The good news, uh, the good that's going to come out of this pandemic is that people are saying that the old standard operating procedures of, uh, you know, using XYZ's regulatory frameworks and 10-year periods, three-year periods, eight-year periods are all uh, radically changing as we begin to look at data and research and analysis coming from preprint servers, never before in history. Have we looked at anything coming from preprint servers? We have only looked at uh, articles coming from peer-reviewed journals. So this is great. This is huge that uh, you know we are having uh, pretty actually I would say almost 99% uh, validity uh, in terms of uh, data coming from preprint servers. And mm. this is this is a brand new. This is the first time ever in the history of our planet that we are looking at information coming from non-peer-reviewed sources, and it is still pretty ethical. It's actually still pretty, uh, pretty, pretty valid to a large extent. There have been a few hiccups here and there, but this is the beginning of a new paradigm. So yeah. I think the uh, so you so see, yeah, I feel that this, uh, you know, as both uh, Tenzin was saying and uh, Professor Reddy, I think that AI is, uh, you know, like any other technology, will have its challenges. Of course, just like the automobile or electric electricity. Whenever we had a new technology, paradigm shifted, and some people were affect, affected poorly by those. Some were not. But that, but that said, AI is perhaps one of the few technological, uh, you know, tsunamis that is happening right now, which is going to bring about, uh, you know, challenge, which are, which are going to bring about solutions for things that we had never dreamt would have, would come from from computers, from computation. And thank God for you know folks like Dr. Reddy are involved in uh, in, yeah. in in engaging with the health sciences and looking at startups from the health sciences. And uh, Professor Reddy, just to your point, I'm myself looking at it now because I think it's a huge venture capital opportunity also for people like us who are in venture world. Uh, Tenzin, you want to, in a way, gear toward the COVID. <clears throat> I mean, there is a lot of things. I completely agree with uh, what Professor Reddy is saying in terms of this has affected, you know, in a very uh, uh, biased way, the poor a lot more. Uh, any thoughts on how technology can bring about inequality? Well, uh, two things. I mean, I, I agree largely with uh, Dr. Reddy's analysis, but we should understand that vulnerability is not just about economic vulnerability, uh, meaning that, you know, if you look at pre-existing health conditions uh, in, the, in the poor demographic and the, the simple idea of exposure to them uh, and whether they actually built immunity or not is, is, is you know, again, a challenging thing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we don't have all the good data sets uh, or, or reliable data sets from all the demographics um, uh, uh, on that issue. But it is true that, you know, we were not prepared. We are actually, as, uh, as uh, governance systems, we are seldom prepared for such calamities. And most of our policies are reactive. You know, they're not sort of, you know, uh, what people would say, let's plan that if in two to three years now, if such a breakout happens, what we would do, what would be the policy that we put into place? Everything has been reactive. And unfortunately, in this country, everything has been politicized. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, that even wearing a mask becomes a political statement. And all. Yeah. So that's one thing. The, the other thing, you know, just going back into the, 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 the intersection of AI and healthcare, uh, one of my colleagues and, um, you know, uh, as I said, that we are working on different inter intersections. Thanks. And uh, they just published an article a couple of months ago in New York Times around a simple thing like how 
the historical data around cardiovascular illnesses and analysis were mostly based on male patients. So most of the female patients will be misdiagnosed uh, or, or their, their, their symptoms will be misdiagnosed. But the thing is that if you create a platform, if you create a machine learning platform, simply based on those data, it will simply continue to perpetuate the same kinds of errors. You see? So yeah. I want to issue a word of caution in this, this whole you know, romanticization of exponential technology, which is simply this. As humans, historically, we have learned from mistakes. But those mistakes were on small scale. And the impact of those mistakes was also somewhat on a small scale, you know, unless you're talking about you know, full-blown wars and things like that. But when we are talking about exponential technology, where it's largely driven by the idea of how quickly you can scale it up, we have to be cautious that the errors or mistakes are not so, sca so scaled up or so exponential or so large that correcting those errors or correcting those mistakes would be way too expensive or even improbable, you see, um, uh, to, 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 to self-correct. And, and this is something that we need to recognize, that we are used to this idea that let's design a technology, let's deploy it, we'll learn where it went wrong, then we'll come back and correct things. But sometimes the, the expense of deploying something prior to sort of thoroughly studying is, is, is too large, you know, and too expensive on, on, on human society. And Dr. Reddy, I'd love for you to address a little bit about it, continuing what you were saying. It's fantastic that we are, we do need to bring technology to give solutions. So uh, to address what Tenzin is also talking about, what are the checks and balances we can put in terms of scaling? We have to have user generated data. We have to roll things out there. We can't wait for five years for perfection. So what are some of the checks and balances you think we can bake into it? I think uh, we can go back to what Dr. Tenzing was saying about the cost to society. If this technology can only be effective if everyone is wearing an interconnected wireless smart sensor watch. Okay? And those watches will cost with the smartphone and so on of the order of at least $100 per person. So I've been kind of struggling at saying, how the hell do we get everybody on the planet one of these things? There are about 8 billion people. And if it's 100 or $125 per person, we were talking about trillion dollar expense. Until last year, you know, even before the COVID, I was thinking about how, the, how do we do these kinds of things. I didn't have a good solution. Now I think I can at least justify a trillion dollar expense in the following sense. U.S., the cost of the recent COVID in U.S. is about $6 trillion. $2.5 trillion has already gone out as relief payments. And the Federal Reserve has actually pumped in another three and a half trillion dollars into the economy. Whether all of that will come back or not, we don't know. Even if it's only two and a half or three trillion dollars, we're talking about if even if U.S. decides we're going to give everyone in the whole world, which is unlikely given the current political situation, uh, one of these things, it will still be cheaper. But if you look at the GDP, the predictions are global GDP and countrywide GDPs are going to be down between 15 to 30 percent. The global GDP is 90 trillion dollars. You know, 10 percent of that is nine trillion dollars. Even if you take the lowest end of the estimates. So the question is, the whole world has lost or kind of uh, got, has gone backwards by about $9 trillion. So by, if I can give everyone a smart watch and if everyone can be, you know, uh, both protected and we can save the whole world, 
that is something worth doing. And yeah. somehow there should be an ethical and moral imperative on the part of the governments of the world to provide that type of a technical solution, you know. You know, today there are many companies that are larger than governments, right? I mean, so how do we have the corporates, the governments, the social organizations, everybody work together to think of things at a large scale, saying, hey, you know, this feels like a trillion, but here are the downside, what do we do, uh, etc. Asha, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the largest corporations that are, you know, Apple and, and yeah. Microsoft and Google, they're yeah. about a trillion dollar or two to one to three, two trillion dollar valuation, market valuation. Right. They can't do this. Only the governments can do it. Right. The government can tax them, tax everybody. Can the government can even tax the, uh, uh, and the whole world, you know, whatever they want to do. Uh, if all that they have to do is, you know, put, put an you know, import tax on or, or tax on all imports from on global trade, we will have the money you need very quickly. Even countries like India, India's you know GDP is only three trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. And ten uh, percent of three trillion dollars is three hundred billion. You can provide everyone in India with a smartwatch for about one point four trillion, uh, four you know billion, uh, one hundred forty billion dollars. Yeah, one point four people. No? So yeah. the, uh, all these yeah. numbers look huge when we talk about it, trillions of dollars and billions of dollars. But in the scheme, in the scheme of things, that is. The, only possible solution that the world has in some sense. Yeah. Asha, Actually, I, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that's an excellent question, by the way. Yeah. So, I think right now, the world has cobbled together some kind of, you know, um, some kind of uh, platforms where maybe a Google or, um, you know, or a Microsoft or an IBM can talk to a government and that can then talk to a WHO, but we have just cobbled it together in the face of the pandemic. We haven't yet established uh, standard operating procedures for going forward. It's the next pandemic and we must plan for the next pandemic. When it happens, what platform is going to be enabling people, uh, enabling these giant entities which are now spanning nation states to talk to each other and really work uh, almost like a startup in coming up with, uh, with quick solutions. Uh, and that includes global warming, by the way. I think the, uh, you do have platforms, uh, Lakshmi, as you know, you know, people like TED, people like Aspen, WHO, uh, and all these are trying to create these uh, you know, conversations which can perhaps help these uh, countries to operate. But right now, WHO, is, since it's focused only on health, it doesn't really leverage platforms like, uh, uh, you know, like Google or Microsoft or IBM. For, for certain technologies that can talk to each other and that can scale and that can pool data so that one can have really reliable AI around it. We don't have that yet. And I am hoping to God that people like Larry Brilliant, who are, uh, you know, who've been part of, you know, spanning both sort of the Google ecosystem and the WHO and the health ecosystem can start thinking like this. In fact, I would say, Lakshmi, this is a, a something that you might want to host for your next conversation, which is to have people like Larry Brilliant say, how do we proactively plan for the next pandemic? You know, I really think that it's not there and there's a desperate need to have something where these are well-oiled. It should be like a well-oiled machine with all these players there that are uh, acting with full speed as soon as we have, you know, a massive fire breaking out somewhere or a glacier breaking free or a next pandemic. So if, if I can uh, jump in, and unfortunately I have to leave in about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, one of the uh, concerns is about privacy. If you have one of these things and everyone is wearing it, what about privacy? Because you, in order to do proximity testing, you need to know the time and location data and all the other things. This is a difficult problem. And the my solution to this is purely uh, social compact in some sense. Basically, 
we need to have laws, you know, it's like, you know, you, you say, you know, I'm, you, can, you can't steal my property or you can't come into the house and steal something. And we, you know, we, it happens. But in general, for privacy, we need to have appropriate punishments. We have that for, with HIPAA rules and so on. Uh, that might not, that won't stop real hackers that are trying to get in. And we have enough technology at this point to anonymize the data so that only very large national players like NSA or you know, equivalent that has uh, huge supercomputers and it'll take them, you know, perhaps weeks to break it so that you can make the likelihood that you will lose your privacy infinitely small or fairly small. And if someone, you know, so that's the only, the, here, another solution I thought about is, let us say, you know, I don't want to wear the watch and, I, you know, in the COVID, then all, all I can say is if you don't have that, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to wear it, but you can't get on an airplane. You can't go into a classroom and you can't go into, if you want or to a sports event or a wedding, if you want to go there at least a week before you have to start wearing this watch because yeah. we can track what your vital state signs are. And then as soon as you finish the event, you can take it off. Yeah. So the issue I think is to come up with, you know, intermediate solutions where if you're going to be in a crowded situation and you're going to infect other people, even though you might be pre asymptomatic, those are the ones we need to kind of deal with. And uh, I think uh, there are partial solutions to those problems, mm -hmm. um, but everyone has to physically have a device so that they can at least wear it. And of course, if you're willing to just stay in home and not even step out like I've been doing for the last six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't, I've only gone out of the house for maybe three times, you know, so yeah. the issue I think is um, how, what your lifestyle is and whether you can or cannot. As I okay. said, if I'm a knowledge worker, I don't have to go out. Yeah. But if I'm a service provider, I have to. And That's also I think thing. as, uh, sorry, as uh, you know, we all have gotten used to privacy, my time, my civil liberties and all that. And someone asked the question, is it only human beings whose uh, uh, you know, health has to be protected? You know, what happened to the climate? What happened to the animals? I mean, maybe it's all better for all of them what has happened uh, right now. So maybe we all gotten too much into my, my uh, information and maybe to some of it, we have to give up to be, you know, for the common good. There is always that, a push and pull uh, that has to be there as well. Um, so there is a question. So one of the question I'd like all of you to answer is, uh, um, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, we have AI systems that uh, we have out there who are learning about us. So is it possible at some point for the AI system to know about our un, uh, un uh, what is it? Uh, unknown biases, I mean, we don't even know what, unconscious biases. Is it possible for the system to know our unconscious biases and show it to us, reflect on us so we become better human beings? I mean, is it possible for the machine to make us a better human being? Uh, Tenzin, uh, would you like to take that? And then Raj and uh, Asha. Yeah, uh, certainly. I, I think uh, the, the predictive algorithms are actually quite sufficient in, in, in telling us what our biases are, and only if we are willing to learn from it. You know, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, we were running some, uh, 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 you know, surveys on self-driving cars and, and the response, social response and behavioral response on self-driving cars. And so, you know, of course, we were trying to, uh, you know, look at sort of historical sort of decision-making data on, on how people would make certain kinds of decisions. And you know, there are many of many of the scenarios that if a car is going at a certain velocity and a pedestrian shows up, you know, uh, should it, uh, you know, swerve right or sh swerve left? And people mostly make utilitarian decisions in terms of, you know, where most lives will be saved and so on. But one of the options we gave was 
what if the car is going at a particular velocity and uh, the, the only two options that are left is either you're going to kill five people or the car could self-destruct by killing the owner of the car. And majority of individuals said, yes, the car should self-destruct. However, I would not buy that car, but I do recommend that uh, the others do. You see? Meaning that it shows you this kind of uh, you know, uh, gap in what we expect of ourselves versus what we expect of society and others in terms of uh, you know, uh, decision-making algorithms and, 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 and moral choices. So I think it can help, at least in the behavioral thing. And remember that humans have not actually perfected ethical learning. Humans, you know, if, if we were to even replicate how humans learn certain things, AI is very primitive in that regard, in, in terms of trying to understand how humans uh, learn about ethical decision-making and so on. But I think that, that at least the bias part of things is something that it can hold a mirror to us uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, inform our behavioral nudges, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Asha and Raj, well, can um, the machine teach us to be better human beings? Can the man-machine interaction create better human beings? Yes, absolutely, uh, Lakshmi. The, right now, if you just go to GPT-3 and start plugging in your data with that intention of sort of wanting to get, uh, you know, get a handle on your unconscious biases, GPT-3 will do it for you right now. It's an yeah. open AI. It's, a, it's available. And uh, it's amazing how much it can make you, how much it gets to know you. I've yeah. seen uh, grown-up people cry <laughs> when, when GPT figures you out. So try using it. I think it's, uh, it's on its way. It's already there. You know? yeah. And yes, we have unconscious biases. The more we are willing to give up our data and open our kimono, the more yeah. I think uh, the AI can tell us about uh, you know, our, our hidden or hidden parts. And I think that's, there can be nothing better. In my own journey, there can be nothing better than something shining a light into yeah. my uh, darker corners. Raj, Dr. Reddy, <coughs> can, the, can all this work we are doing, uh, you're on mute, uh, Dr. Reddy. Yeah. 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 So can the man make us better human beings? I mean, can the machine yeah. make us better human beings? Yeah. I think we, we need to look to, you know, Honorable Dalai Lama and the people like that to tell us how to be better human beings. <laughs> and they, they have the moral authority to do that. The sad part is almost all of us have biases. Yes. And, um, and the only time you get the luxury of thinking about biases and how to make yourself a better human being is when you're not hungry, when, you know, there is this <laughs> Very true. theory of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you have, you know, if you can't feed yourself and you can't do this, all the other higher level moral issues never come up to the fore. So human beings, are, all the people that are at the bottom of the pyramid will not only have biases, they will be visceral. They will, in fact, do things like vote for Trump you know, or something <laughs> because they are unhappy with the, their lot and say, all these people, you know, it's easy for them to quantificate, but what about me? You know, so uh, I, I don't know. I think, you know, the, unfortunately, moral and ethical education that is supposed to come from churches and other things only happen when people go to church or only happen when parents are, are, you know, instruct the children. And we are kind of getting to a stage that is getting lost. And, uh, and I think I, I recommend that you look at Maslow's hierarchy and say, the only way you're going to get, you know, an ethical moral society is when all of us go up to the top of the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy. Lakshmi, you're muted. Or at least if all of us get out of the base. <laughs> well, I, 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 if, I, if I may, uh, just right, a brief course. comment. I, I, I largely agree with Dr. Reddy that Maslow's hierarchy and, and its fulfillment is important. But when it comes to ethical choices and ethical perception of the world, 
we cannot limit ourselves to that, meaning that, you know, Wall Street and Silicon Valley is far above the survival mode. But we are not looking at them for ethical decision making either. So I think, you know, again, coming back to radical honesty, that we do need to instill, you know, a, a reflective mindset in, in, in society and cannot simply wait that, you know, when people fulfill their, their fundamental basic needs, that automatically they would gravitate towards, uh, you know, a, a collective wellness or collective well-being model, because we have not seen that exemplified uh, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. Basically, if you look at, forget about the poor, poor people, let's take the top 1%. They're super rich. Yeah. You know, their incomes are millions of dollars a year. Not all of them are unbiased. Not all of them uh, are behaving in a way that we would expect uh, a, a good human being to, to behave. And there's something missing in their, their background and education. And uh, recently I read somewhere, um, as soon as they discovered the campaign funding is not as much as the other one, suddenly two or three rich, very rich people came and gave the money that is needed. So these kinds of things just shows from their perspective, what is happening in the world is wrong and they want to change the world. I don't know if all of you saw the recent movie Social Dilemma that has come out, which is causing a lot of conversations about should companies spend time to make sure you stay glued to the screen? Should like all this super intelligence be applied to just having you glued to the screen or should some of it be about solving the problem? And sometimes the money making becomes the end and, uh, you know, how do I keep you along with me as long as possible becomes the destination. So would love, uh, there are some questions about that uh, that have been asked about uh, uh, the responsibility of uh, companies who have billions of people on their platforms to uh, not focus so much on keeping them on the screen. What is the balance? What uh, would love to hear your thoughts on technology used for social good versus technology used to keeping you on the screen. So there's one comment here about my civil liberties would not be curtailed yeah. unless I am ready to give up my privacy. Yeah. That is not a fair way of saying it. just because you have civil liberty doesn't give you the right to come and infect me, you right. know, and, and so the issue is what is the right thing to do in that kind of situation? Maybe Right. Can, can, can tell us yeah. what is the right thing to do. Yeah. I have my civil liberties, but does it give me the right to come and infect you? Yeah. I, I yeah. think, uh, you know, again, a uh, couple of things. First, uh, first thing with social, uh, this, uh, this, this film that yeah. has come out, uh, I'm of two minds about it. Yeah. Uh, one is, yes, we are largely an attention economy and we are learning to exploit people's attention and so on. But, you know, most of the individuals in that film, so I'm glad that, you know, it's out. I'm glad that people are becoming more aware of it. But most of those individuals in the film that, that uh, some I have, I have known personally for quite some time, they were warned about this issue when they had actually joined the company. Yeah. And when they were promoted as executives within that company, you know. Yeah. Uh, so for them to now, after making their money, selling their companies to those companies, come out and do this thing. You know, for me, it almost appears like Chapo Guzman or Pablo Escobar wearing T-shirts that says, let's make a drug-free world. Right, yeah. Meaning that show me with your actions that you are actually trans, you know, truly tra transformed to the point that you are going to use all the economic incentives and benefits that you have received towards shaping a better world. You know, and, and this is what I mean, that there's so much virtue signaling going on that it is not actually yielding uh, real results and so on. Mm -hmm. the, the, the second part around civic, civic liberties and privacy issue is this. Uh, it's, you know, the, the, the relationship to privacy, I am looking at it as a generational thing. You know, the way the previous generation related to data is very different from how 
uh, the millennials or Gen Z relate to data and so on. But again, if you're talking about privacy and, you know, and, and again, Dr. Reddy has proposed very good things about, you know, that you have to be uh, a responsible member of civic society. And so you have to give up certain forms of privacy. But let then that be the rule of thumb. You know, don't make privacy a currency. You see, why is it that only wealthy individuals can afford privacy? Why is it that they can only buy, uh, you know, private islands, uh, you know, uh, uh, afford private networks and so on? Meaning that, again, you know, make it a rule of thumb for all of society. But we are not doing that. And, and I think there's an there's a inbuilt sense of cynicism that those who are actually questioning privacy, and Paul Nemitz, another good friend who helped write the GDPR for European Union, we have, we have had this conversation numerous times, that, that those who are wealthy are talking about, you know, that, that civic society should retract and become more liberal about certain kinds of privacy issues. You see? But make it a rule of thumb. Make it for everyone then. You see? Yeah. We are I, making it in a way where privacy has become a currency. Go ahead, Asha. May I, may I, okay, yeah, let me go ahead and give a couple of just a minute before I, I run out. Uh, so for me, I feel that on this movie question that you asked, Lakshmi, about the social dilemma, and about, you know, what is it an ethical, uh, you know, obligation on the part of these companies. So let me uh, state very clearly here for the, you know, people who are watching us and for all of us, that Google's MO is very simple. It is to get you out of its website ASAP. If you can leave in one second from its search box, it doesn't want you there for two seconds. Yeah. So, uh, so even if I may come across as a bit of a biased party, the truth is that, yes, when you have, you know, people like Facebook and other parties wanting you there for five hours or six hours, Google wants you there for one second. No, but and, Google uh, search so is different than a YouTube or some other things, right? The other, the, co the content other property. Consumption wants you to stay. <clears throat> the search may want you to get out, but the content consumption wants you to stay. Right? But they're, would, they're, they're main right? meat and potatoes though, uh, Lakshmi. They're right. meat and potatoes. Their main business is search. And in, in search, what they are looking for is simply to really for you to get out in one second. They don't want you hovering on the search bar. So I think they, uh, you're right that it's, it's ancillary businesses are about eyeballs and about having attention. The moral and the ethical dilemma there has to do with uh, the fact that there is an addictive component to social media. You know, at this hours, is especially in the, in the developed world, we are a lonely society. We are, uh, you know, we are seeking, uh, you know, to connect with other people in some meaningful way. And this loneliness is leading to unprecedented amounts of, uh, of addiction. And I think, uh, you know, social media is an addiction. They have figured out certain, I mean, you know, you, you know, you get that like button from Facebook, you immediately have a, you know, a dose of dopamine in your brain. So, I, you know, there is, people have figured this out. And, uh, you know, the, uh, there are some, some of the media, social media companies are being pointed. They are being called out actually now about the, about the addictive component of its, uh, of its offerings and you know, of its services. So it's changing, but slowly. Uh, but it's a, it's a good movie, Lakshmi, and I'm really glad you pointed out because everybody should watch it, you know, about, uh, because most of us, you know, just, like our just like our unconscious biases, most of us don't know about our right. unconscious, uh, you know, addictive pathways. So... This is something that uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. First of all, we have 15 more minutes. I request all of you to stay because there are some questions from the audience. Uh, one is uh, Aditya Kanoria is asking, do you think democracy will survive the world with ethics? Uh, in, in, there is with, the, uh, with, the, with all of us evolving the way, in what way will democracy survive? So Raj, Asha, Tenzin, just one or two lines about whatever your thought is. Maybe I'll go first. How about that? A, B, and C. Yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the democracy side, uh, Lakshmi, I think the more uh, honest we are with ourselves, the better mm -hmm. we know ourselves, the better and deeper is our democracy. Mm -hmm. It's when we don't know ourselves that we are acting blindly and that we can get manipulated. But if mm -hmm. the power was within us to know ourselves, to know what is a good life, to know what is consumption, right mm -hmm. now we are consuming... Uh, uh, in, in addictive ways. We don't need that, you know, 26 t-shirt or that 50 second pair of shoes, uh, you know, and yet we are consuming it, right? And I think, again, that's, that's an addictive behavior. And uh, as long as we human beings don't, we, as long as we are blinded 
by all these things which take them take us away from our true selves yeah. we are going to be in deep trouble and the weaker we are the weaker our democracy so maybe what we can do is instead of all of you answering each question i'll ask different one different questions so we can get through more questions uh, so dr reddy uh, uh, ratish is asking how do we employ ethics readily into new organization that's being built in india is there a way of thinking about this to begin today you know in new companies how do we integrate ethics into new organizations as we are building them i think uh, this is the right question for dr tenzin not for me okay <laughs> tenzin what do you say i, I think uh, you know one is uh, 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 that when you when you are shaping the organizational culture you know to to make sure that you know you're not just going for good sounding mission or vision statements but it actually is uh, filtered down into the culture of the organization and that you're doing everything to promote that culture uh, uh you know the culture of well-being the culture of wellness the culture of trust transparency these are sort of uh, essential ingredients uh to foster a, a a healthy organization which in the long term uh, builds in uh, the sense of loyalty and and innovation and 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 uh, critical lenses uh, for for both i think product design and development sort of thing um uh, so those are the things that that i would i would suggest uh you know one should not think of just uh you know uh, i mean it has been again oftentimes when we think of ethics it's it's mostly a pr statement and and i think uh you know uh, at the expense of sounding cynical uh, i think uh, those days are long gone and they actually have not done much well for world at large so stay away from ethics as a pr statement yeah. uh, maybe dr reddy you can answer this there is a question about china you know will china win the race in exponential technologies as they don't have much sense of ethics from eric so there's a lot of things in it <laughs> to answer but i don't what, know if they yeah. don't have any sense of ethics It's, they have a different set of values and different set of ethics and uh, for the things where they think is important they follow but there are things um the things that they are not having um you know you know the people have accused them of not controlling the the pandemic mm-hmm. people have accused them of um stealing secrets and all kinds of things all of them is kind of a human nature not chinese or indian or something all of us uh no it's bad to steal but if you're desperate enough you know i was in south africa and uh, the stealing and you know petty petty crime is so pervasive every every home has a safe you know, a security guard <laughs> so it's it's a very different kinds of uh, situations so and everyone thinks it's okay to steal then no problem <laughs> i think you're being called raj i have been i have to go thank okay. you very much thank you so much we have few more minutes asha and then then if you say that would be great uh, thank you um so uh, uh, there is a question for uh, uh, tenzin uh, regarding the threats to civil society and uh, this is an asking this question regarding the threats to civic society Oh, sorry the screen keeps moving um and uh, institutions posed by technology in addition to excessive screen time can you think of what are some other threats we have to watch out for i mean one of the things we say is oh you know being liked and screen time and things are there any other things we should watch out for yeah uh, fake news is a big threat um, uh, it continues to increase sort of uh, polarization uh, mm-hmm. in society uh but uh, you know we have to keep watching out for deep fakes uh, another sort of gift of uh, ai platforms where uh, it will become uh, much more difficult to tell uh, truth from lies 
uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, 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 it uh, you know it it poses a challenge on all kinds of levels not just sort of political choices but even legal system you know what becomes an evidence uh, for example uh, uh, when with the advent of deep fakes and so on you know democracy as i said it's not the perfect system of governance it's the best we have and the only reason it works is because of this inbuilt spirit that democracy is a self correcting system see mm-hmm. and humans our self correcting system meaning if we want to grow if we want to truly flourish we have to self correct but mm-hmm. the moment this ability to self correct is compromised mm-hmm. or the ability to self correct gets contaminated by confusion of fake news and lies and so on uh mm-hmm. you know democracy comes to a halt and then it starts to regress and mm-hmm. not just democracy it happens with our uh legal systems it uh, happens with our law enforcement systems and so on so there there are a lot of these kinds of threats and again you know we are not at the place where we can just reset everything we can't say let's get rid of technology and go back to the caves you see right. that is not going to happen so we need to sort of more proactively start thinking about you know how are certain kinds of technologies that were designing uh, truly going to uh impact human society in certain ways so for one exa- one example one of the companies in germany you know in order to counter surveillance mechanism they are producing more confusing deep fakes to be able to confuse the surveillance systems but it is it is being regarded as ai for social good in some ways because it is countering uh you know uh, uh sort of uh, totalitarian regimes and surveillance and and those kinds of things so you know there is no singular sort of absolutism around around ethical uh rules or 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 framing but we have to deeply reflect on what would be best uh in the short and long term so asha maybe you can take this question from nitin to saying as we look at systems increasing taking active role in influencing decisions like uh how do we th- uh, think about designing ethical system from standpoint of assuming responsibility and accountability so uh, how do we make sure the the technology system that we are designing itself takes into itself sense of responsibility and accountability uh, what should technology companies do or what things we should keep in mind so i think uh, lakshmi we are in the first i would say we are in the first generation of uh, of uh, technology innovation i would say you know the first generation is where you know you you run into let's say over a 100 year period you have this uh you know you have a situation where there is uh, you know there is there is the there is the you know there's a discovery of computation there is the discovery of the internet there is a creation of the internet there is a creation slowly of social media so in the whole ecosystem of let's say startups <clears throat> you'll find that some companies will make it while you know 10 to 15 others in that same space will die now why is that so right part of the reason is because they are addressing or they are actually appealing to the to the you know to the millions and so why is it that that facebook survived while while myspace and many other giants friendster and all these companies the first generation which was there they died uh you know are they are they providing to the to the you know to the millions what they want uh so that's that's one question second question i think is that as so as time goes forward you know there is a polishing going on within these companies also there is as and also as as it engages with civil society you do have you know you do have civil society groups ethics groups like uh, you know like tenzins various other, even the in fact uh, you know you will have a lot of people from university networks interfacing with some of these uh, companies in um, bringing them to think about ethical dimensions of what it means for so much screen time or for, or for so much of consumption of social media a lot of them are already thinking with it there is a lot of angst within even i mean even within facebook about how much time to can do how for how long do you want those eyeballs on your screen because if you want you can have them and so the, in that competition as the market i think la- right now it's all driven by the market where where you know the 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 value is being assigned to how much time that people spending on your platform and things like that i think as we go forward hopefully with this whole you know with the evolution of the pandemic also i think there are going to be there are going to be re there are going to be some questions about what is the meaning of how do we assign a public good to uh, you know value to a public good like let's say uh, altruism right or let's say 
helping uh, you know people in the pandemic let's say those who are volunteering right now for the vaccine trials right i mean how do you assign a value to these things which are how do you call it a public good for example we already have the good news is we have things like clean air now being defined as a public good right so now what has emerged for clean air is you have these car carbon trading platforms that have come up because people started saying that there is that clean air is a public good and it's a value that it is value to be assigned to that as a result whatever people industries are generating for carbon uh, they, they you know so there's a whole carbon market that has now emerged because of uh, clean air being uh, you know being designated as a social good in the case of social media and these the technology platforms we don't know where exactly to to call which element of it a public good right so do we so for example if you let's say you have you know a zillion terabytes of data related to uh, to you know to, to 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 the correlates between certain diseases and the and and vulnerability to let's say covid-19 right let's say you have that data the use of that data for for general good is that a public good we haven't even got into that debate yet and once we do i have a feeling that there is going to be just like the carbon trading platform there's going to be another trading platform that's going to emerge which will talk about to what extent do we have permission based uh, compromises of privacy so i'm not sure where you know we are not yet there of course i think it's absolutely certain that technology companies right now have you know have are just in the beginning are just beginning to scratch the surface of what it means uh, in terms of an ethical deployment of of uh, technology on on especially on social media i think but uh, the you know we are just beginning to scratch the surface but i think in the longer uh, you know range of things i do feel that things like the pandemic are going to make us come up with a different set of standards for uh, for assessing what is a public good and what's not you muted lakshmi yeah we have about 5 minutes so after you answer why don't you take a minute to just wrap up your thought on the conversation so far the monk and the machine and the tensions you know the uh, the uh, department that is running raj you this conversation with all this what would be your parting remarks for this conversation i would say uh, uh lakshmi i would say as we go forward i just hope that those who are listening and those who are all of us on the panel uh, that we really look at uh, as we go forward that we look at um, um, some pretty serious discussions on uh, on redefining uh, what is the good life how much what is the meaning of consumption and uh, how much do we need to consume to have a good life is mm -hmm. there is there a redefinition is there a re rethinking on consumption and is that something that we can and i actually feel that india should be on the forefront of that because we has a, as an old, as an ancient generation have always known and always have always talked about maya we have always talked about the fact that maya can can you know can can distract us and can take us off track onto what is a genuinely good life and uh, i think india should take the lead on this because right now good life is defined by the young west and that's all about consumption yeah yeah material Great. consumption so uh, tenzin i want to wrap up with talking about your book that's what we started with um you've been you actually you, uh, you know asha tenzin was on a panel with larry brilliant recently so they were having oh, nice. in all these conversations uh, tenzin uh, at the end of the day what would you like to accomplish with your book uh, and uh, just tell us let's wrap up on that uh, because it's got the man the machine the monk and everything in it <laughs> no, thank you thank you uh uh you know the uh, the first chapter of the book opens with a quote from krishna murthy it is no measure of health to mm -hmm. be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society mm -hmm. it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society we don't look at economists to inform us how meaningful our relationships are we don't measure love we like to at times uh, but we don't measure deeply caring and loving relationships uh, in language of economies uh, ec economists and so on and so the entire move i think is that we need to start to broaden our horizon to think beyond transactional relationships 
We cannot think about moving beyond transactional relationships and consumer attitude if you are simply thinking of nature in terms of carbon tax, uh, and if you're thinking of uh, you know, clean air uh, simply as a compensation uh, phenomena of, of, of some sort, that we need to fundamentally redefine what humans are, how do we relate to each other, how do we relate to environment. Otherwise, we'll be trapped in our own narratives of productivity, of progress, but you know, exponential growth is not leading to exponential happiness. It's not leading to exponential joy. It's not leading to exponential trust. There is a gap. And, and that's what we need to sort of deeply focus on. Great. So, um, you know, running toward mystery, please get the book and uh, you'll get to know uh, what Tenzin is talking about. And we have, uh, we have a, a, you can see what the book looks like. And um, thank you. And, uh, and I wanted to say thank you. And Priyadarshi, nice to meet you. Like and uh, okay. stay yeah. in touch. Let me enjoy. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Thank you. So I just thank want you. to wrap up by thanking all of you for giving us the most uh, valuable thing you possess, which is your time and uh, get to know uh, Tenzin, get to know Asha, get to know Raj and ask all the questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions. We did our best. And uh, this conversation is ongoing. I mean, the whole point of AI and what are the, what is the foundation of it? How do we teach our children about AI? How do we use technology responsibly? The continuing conversation. In fact, we are working with uh, Intel to host it October 12th through 15th. Uh, whoever is interested, please let us know. It's a four day conversation on future of AI. What, what difference will it make in health, in smart mobility, in education, everything. And we are looking at it. So you can join the conversation. So thank you very much. The only thing I want everybody to take away is that we are just at the tip of the iceberg of what is AI, in what way will it matter to us. The only thing that will take us to a place of positivity is how we use our mind and our heart and our sense of ethics to balance always uh, our sense of privacy, our sense of entitlement with a sense of public service we need to do. It's always a balance. So there's no perfect answer. These are all conversations. And thank you so much, uh, both Tenzin and Asha, for your time. And we'll continue. Thank you, Lakshmi, for having us. This was yeah. wonderful. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.